Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate podcast. I'm your co-host, Lolita, also joined by Kyle. Today on the show, we have Michael Krieg with us. Mike, great to have you on our show. How's it going? Going well. It's great, it's great to be here. Thanks. Thanks for your time today. Uh, before we get into the interview, here's a little bit about Mike. Mike is the co-founder of Steeple Rock Partners, LLC. He has helped provide investor funds to purchase over 3,200 apartment and self-storage units worth over $120 million. And in addition, he has also raised money uh, for nonprofit organizations in, uh, in both startup and development phases. So Michael has been investing in real estate for 14 years and currently has investment property in Mexico, Austin, and San Antonio as a buy and hold investor. So looking forward to this interview, there's great content to be discussed. So with that being said, Mike, could you please tell the investors a little bit more about yourself and what you currently do? Yeah, so I live here in Austin, Texas, and uh, been investing in real estate really since about 2003. got the bug really uh, in a very unexciting way. I was sitting in uh, an investments class in business school at the University of Montana and just understood real estate. So from then, I really knew that, hey, at some point, uh, part of my long-term financial plan is gonna, it's gonna involve real estate. So I uh, got started early, really just in residential, buying a, you know, turning a, a home into a, a rental property and then kind of went into some residential multifamily. Uh, properties and then scaled up into syndications and larger deals, um, apartment communities and so forth. So we, we, um, yeah, we're here in Austin. Uh, I'm married, uh, been married for, you know, we're, we're going to celebrate 20 years next, I guess in 2020, it'll be 20 years. Wow. Congratulations. Uh, yeah. I met my wife on a train to Estonia in Moscow. Um, and, uh, Got three kids. One's a teenager. She's going to be driving here soon and a couple of kids in grade school. So life is very uh, fun and exciting and busy. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. Year. Awesome. Thanks for that. So in your role at Steeple Rock Partners, you're focused on raising money for other operators. How do you go about finding these operators for your passive investors? Yeah, well, you know, it starts with, um, I mean, this is a highly relational business. And so our operators, you know, we've got relationships with them. And these are, these are people that are uh, really at the top of their game, um, high character, uh, have got a really strong track record in the industry. They've done multiple deals, successful exits. Typically, they're folks who have, you know, in, um, somebody on the team has been through the recession. So we like to see a long track record. Uh, we, we like to see, obviously, you know, there's, there's basic stuff like, has this person ever been in any legal issues with the SEC? So we look at those things on a, on a very basic level, but, but um, we like to see teams who are, who are good at what they do and who have high integrity and character. And um, you know, it's, it's about trust and it's about relationships. And so we don't have a, t- a lot of operating partners, um, but the four, four or five that we have um, those, those are typically, um, how, how we found them is just through relationships and people that we've known for a little while and we trust. Is it typical to have someone raise money for another person's deals? Yeah, it is. It's, it's really common. Um, a lot of syndicators, you know, a lot of the deals we're doing requires, you know, if it's like a, if it's a $20 million deal, which might be kind of on the small side of what we're doing, 15 to $20 million deal is small, probably smaller. The larger ones are 40 to 50 million they're raising anywhere from seven to $20 million. So even if you've got a syndicator who has been in the business for a while and they've got a bunch of investors, they might be able to raise, you know, two, three, $4 million. But typically there's always a, another capital partner, uh, a key principal, somebody who's coming in with significant equity. It could be a private equity company, could be a private real estate investment company like ours. Um, and so, so it's pretty common. In the okay. Industry. And you mentioned you uh, raised for about four or five operators. What systems do you have in place to ensure that operators are good stewards of your investors' money? You mentioned relationships, but is there something on the back end once the deal's kind of closed that you have that that makes sure that the operator is still abiding by kind of their standards and values? Yeah, I think think one thing uh, that I like about the syndication model is it, it is highly regulated by the SEC. So I think there are, there are pretty severe penalties for, for fraud or misbehavior or any of that. 
And so there's, there's some built in legal structure that we, we really like, um, you know, um, ongoing, I mean, the, the structure of the business typically is such that the, you know, it, when you have, for example, an 80, you know, 8% preferred rate and a 70, 30 split, the general partner who's the sponsor running the deal, they don't get compensated until the investors get paid first. So that structure helps. Um, but, but really, you know, I also like to see that, um, sponsors are doing deals because it's furthering their business and not just to do a deal. Uh, we like to see that as well because, you know, we really need to see, um, an alignment of, of the sponsor interest with investors. And when you see that, and when you understand, I mean, if these guys, you know, if, if you mess a deal up as a sponsor, it's really hard to do the next deal. And so they're, they're keeping that in mind. And so we like to see that, um, those, those interests are aligned, um, in, in, in every deal that we do. So when you talk about that interest being aligned, are there certain key factors that you look into, um, as far as that's concerned? Yeah, I, I think, you know, usually, um, the splits, how the splits are structured, the waterfalls. Um, I like to see that above a certain, you know, IRR, if the split is, um, if, there, if there's an incentive for the sponsor to do even better, uh, I like to see that because it tells me that they're going to strive to, to manage this asset even better than, you know, um, perhaps a deal where there's not that kind of incentive. Now, some people look at that and might say, well, they're taking more. I don't, I don't like that they're doing that. Well, you know, they're, they're going to be motivated by that incentive. I actually like to see that because it pulls the whole deal up. So I think you want to see, I think you want to see those incentives in place. Um, the passive investor, you know, typically a lot of these deals you're getting a decent deal. You're getting between 18 to 22% annual, an average annual return. So, um, you know, there are op, you know, to, to see, to see, um, incentives that are pushing that higher. I think that's only a good thing for us. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Have you had a situation where you've raised money for someone else's deal and it's not performed to its expectations? So maybe the sponsor didn't do anything wrong, but it's just not hitting the returns where you kind of expected. Yeah, not, not yet. Uh, most, most of the deals are hitting right about expectations and even exceeding those. The, one of the things we emphasize, there are two, there are two principles that we really emphasize. Um, and one is preservation of capital. Um, we want to see that is a val that's our value with our company. Uh, but we want to see that that's a value that the sponsor has as well. And with that um, is, is conservative underwriting. And so if, if these deals are underwritten conservatively, what I, what I mean by that is if the rent projections for example, over time are conservative and they're not aggressive. Like if, for example, if they're factoring in, um, like a lot of these deals are value add deals. So what they're going to do is they're going to go in and rehab, you know, the units and they're going to have a, a comp rent rate based on similar properties in the, in the area. But also, you know, there's a, there's a, um, an increase in rent costs in the market and it could be anywhere from two to 5% depending on where you are. You know, if it's, if the market has done say three or 4% and they're underwriting to that, well, that might be kind of aggressive. Um, but you know, if it's 2%, that's conservative. So we, we like to see that also that's, that's a hedge for us. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So there's just built in upside versus downside, I think is what you're saying. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Okay, perfect. So since you raise money for other sponsors, who does your investor deal with once the deal is closed? Do they still go through you if they have any questions or are they then kind of introduced to the sponsor and the sponsor will answer all their questions? No, we, we handle all investor communications. So, so we're, we're, the, we're co general partners on the deals we do. So we're, that's our role is to report regularly. Um, we typically on a multifamily deal will report every month on the property, on its performance, how many units have we renovated, how, we, how we're performing, you know, how the rents are changing over time. So we'll do that every month. And some deals, it's every quarter, but it, it's typically us. I mean, we're communicating. And, and the nice thing for the investor on that is a lot of syndicators are, 
you know, they're not really built to handle investor relations. Investors have lots of questions all the time. And syndicators, once they, you know, once they get to a certain level of, or a certain number of investors, it's really difficult for them to really do that well. And so, you know, we have a little bit more of a personal touch. We're constantly involved you know, on the phone, emailing. Um, if people have questions, they follow up. But, you know, we've got a portal that we've uh, built where people can, you know, if they're in like five or six deals, they can see, you know, their K1, they can see, hey, I've got this deal, this amount, here are all my distributions. Um, a lot of syndicators may not even have that. They don't have, you know, like a website you can go to and see all of your investments. So we have a portal where if you're with three or four or five different sponsors and different deals in different markets, it's all on one web, web page. So that's part of the value that we add. And people like that, you know, the syndicators like that as well. Um, that's not something they can do. And in some cases we're handling, in some of the deals we're actually handling the, the uh, K ones as well. Oh and wow. Okay. The tax at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for someone brand new, who's never invested in a deal and is considering doing this, how much personalization is there between the investor and uh, basically you, the, the person raising money? Can they call you? Can they email yeah. you kind of on, on anything? How much communication can they have with, with you? Yeah, as, you know, as much as needed. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm talking, my primary role is, is to interface with investors and answer all the questions. I mean, these assets, this is different. I mean, this is not, there isn't a lot of education about syndications and a lot of folks just don't know. Even in business school, I mean, can you imagine I went through business school and there wasn't any teaching on a syndication, how it works, how, how they're structured. And so there is not a lot of education out there. The, the learning curve for a passive investor is pretty steep. Mm -hmm. um, the PPM itself, I mean, it's 50 to 80 page legal document is so daunting. Uh, there are just a ton of questions. And so I feel like one of my primary roles, that's why I love you guys have this podcast, it's to educate investors because it's such a great way to invest. And most people don't know about it. So yeah, we spend a lot of time just answering questions. Um, every deal, you know, over time, it's, it's really fun to see an investor kind of learn, oh, hey, I understand these terms. I know what average annual return is, cash on cash. I know how the preferred rate works. Um, these are questions sometimes that investors are even afraid to ask, maybe a little embarrassed to ask. But um, it, you know, that's our role. You know, we, we are educators and really servants and stewards of, of capital and helping people to meet their goals. And so that, that's, I think, and, and I think that that's one of the probably biggest overlooked aspects of syndication is just the, the real need for education and helping investors understand what they're getting into. Um, there's a lot of general education about syndications, but then there's sort of deal specific questions that people have and we're available. You know, a lot of it's email. Um, sometimes when email doesn't work, we get on the phone, we're talking through things, highly relational. Um, I like to have as much of a personal relationship with my investors as possible. Um, I, I do have investors who I have not met yet face to face that, that do invest with us, but you know, it's always, you know, with a view toward, Hey, you know, at some point let's get a cup of coffee, get a, get a lunch somewhere. Um, but that's, yeah, that's our main role. That's, that's what we do. Awesome. Awesome. All about relationships, right? Yep. So um, I think raising money sometimes gets a bad rap, at least um, from my perspective. Can you talk about why you raise money for other people's deals? Yeah. Well, I think, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't heard a whole lot about the bad rap thing. Um, I, I think, number one, for, from the syndicator perspective, it's, it's really valuable. There, there's so much in a syndication. When you, when you go in, when you're buying an apartment community, there, it is the, the first, you know, those six to eight weeks before you close on a deal, it can be so stressful. I mean, you are writing big checks um, for like the down payment on the property, the legal fees. Uh, there's, and, and these are, you know, th these are checks in the tens of thousands of dollars. There's a lot of stress. You've got to do environmental tests. You've got to do all of these things that you're trying to manage. And to have someone, I mean, one of the stressors can be, gosh, are we going to have enough equity? I mean, if you, you know, if you got to raise five to $10 million um, and you think you've got half that, you know, you're, you're starting from a position of, man, I hope we can close this deal. And so it's a huge uh, value for them that we can bring capital in. And, and that's kind of a done deal for this indicator. So, 
And that's why, um, you know, we get calls, Hey, Hey, we're doing a deal. We want your involvement. Come help us. So we are getting those kind of calls and, you know, the syndicators really see the value in it. And obviously, um, from, from our perspective, where we are is we're able to kind of, you know, we don't just focus on one asset class. We're looking at, um, you know, mobile home parks. We, we typically like we have a mobile home park fund where we'll buy, you know, 15 to 20 with a, with a top 10 operator in the, in the U S and we've got self storage partner. So this out, this allows us to provide different types of assets in different markets with different syndicators. Um, you know, if we're, if we're focusing on capital and bringing equity in, we can kind of, you know, be more diversified in this space. So I think that's, that's what our investors like, you know, some of them might be investing with one operator in one city and they're coming and saying, Hey, I got to get out of this city and I got to get with somebody else. Can you show me something different? Can you show me a mobile home park deal? You know, who's your operator for self storage? So I think investors really value that and they like that. And so it's really fun to be able to provide that kind of diversification and just personally too. I mean, I'm an investor too. I'm investing in these deals and that's kind of where it all begins. I am an investor. Who do I want to invest in? Well, I don't want to just be with one syndicator in one city. I want to, I want to be in different markets. You know, there's like right now this year, you know, there's probably about eight to 10 markets that are really great for multifamily. You know, I don't want to just sit in one of them. I want to be in several of them and, and Hey, self storage is a great place to be as well. So, um, that's one of the that's one of the big advantages we have focusing primarily on uh, equity and capital. Okay, awesome. So I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit, but since you focus on multiple different asset classes, how do you make sure that you're fully educated on each of those and making sure they're a good investment? Because you know they're different from one another. Certainly, self storage, yeah. you have the same type of metrics, but you're, you're looking at at different things. You know, people moving into the city, out of the city. Um, yeah. versus some things with multifamily might be a little bit different. So how do you vet deals and make sure that they're good for your investors and, and for you personally? Yes, that's a great question. Um, I think it starts, it starts with education because for example, self storage is a different animal. Now some of the general um, sort of principles of real estate and commercial real estate apply to self storage that would apply to multifamily. So there's a lot that, that carries over. The deal structure might be the same, you know, 8%, 70-30 split. Um, but the way that you underwrite a deal, the way that you look at the market, so typically we'll, we'll do top-down analysis um, on a deal. What's the market? Who's the team? And what is the deal specifically? So, um, and, and, you know, with, with mobile home parks or with self-storage, that's a little bit of a different process. You know, um, with self-storage, for example, um, you know, we have to go through an education process with the operator to say, Hey, how do you guys find a good deal? How do you, you know, I need to know from you, what is a bad sort uh, self storage deal? You know, what is a good one? And how am I going to know, you know, so that we went through this like a year ago. Um, how do I know this deal in Atlanta is a really good deal? You know, and so they kind of walk us through, well, this is how we know. We know that the traffic count has to be more than 20,000 cars. We know that with, you know, we're going to have to do a market study, you know, one mile, three mile, five miles. And we're going to have to look at the various entry because these things can be built uh, a lot cheaper than a multifamily apartment community. And so they're going to do a market study. These guys have a team that literally goes out and does that. And now I'm beginning to understand, okay, this, these are the things we look at um, when we look at a self storage deal that is not true of a multifamily. So I think just checking those boxes, going through a process, I think it's really important in every deal, um, what is the checklist? You know, when I'm looking at the market, what are the 10 to 15 things I need to look through and make sure those are in place? You know, is there job growth? Is there company migration? Um, is there, you know, barrier to entry of, of c competitors into the space? If I'm gonna hold this thing for five years, is they gonna build another one down the road? Um, mobile home parks, little different equation there too, but, but we have to be educated, we have to learn it. And, and then of course, after that, it's like, okay, am I investing in this? You know, I've been investing in multifamily apartments. Here's a self storage deal. Am I putting my money in? And, and I look at the deal. I'm like, yeah, I am. Now do my friends and family and investors, are, are they going to want to look at this? Okay. Yeah. And so then we just go from there. Okay. What is your favorite asset class at this given time and why? Yes. Um, 
Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to answer that question because, like, I think any deal, like, like a really good multifamily deal in a great market, uh, you know, is going to be better than like a self storage deal. But I think industry, like, if you, if you sort of generalize everything right now, I think I like self storage the best. But when I say that, I'm, I'm really talking about like a small margin different than multifamily. I'm not talking. There's not a lot of space between that and multifamily and mobile home parks. The reason I say that is because, um, you know, the underwriting on multifamily apartments, there are, there's, there's, a, there, there's a lot of um, competition and the prices are going up a little bit. The cap rates are getting compressed in multifamily. There are still a lot of good deals and I think they're going to continue to be deals. Self-storage, if bought well, have uh, more recession resistance. Uh, I, they're, they're slightly better uh, performers in a recession than even multifamily. Now, the whole reason we're in multifamily is because it's low risk and it's very recession proof, but self-storage just does a little bit better. And so I like that right now because we're, something's gonna happen in the economy. I think we're probably gonna experience some kind of recession. Something's gonna slow down. If, I don't think it's gonna be as severe as before. And I don't, I don't even know if we're gonna see it that much in the South, like in the Sunshine States. But something's going to at least flatten out for a little while. I like that asset class. I think there's a lot of upside potential. A lot of those deals are, you know, 2.2 to 2.7x over five or six years. So you're getting a little bit more on the back end. Um, yeah, and if you don't need the cash flow today, the self-storage deal doesn't do as well on cash in the first couple of years. But it's, you know, it does better on the back end. And I think the fact that Wall Street's beginning to buy these things more and more and, and REITs are coming in. Um, you have a potential for a sale uh, to an you know, institutional buyer, which is fantastic. So I, I, that's, my, that's my favorite, but I, I still like them all. You know, I, <laughs> I like a good multifamily deal still too. All right. The lead is going to take us into our final four questions now. All right, Mike, let's go ahead and dive into the final four questions. Okay. So what is the one tool that you use in real estate uh, that you could not do without? <laughs> okay, so this is the nerdy part of my brain. Well, I, I think the Excel spreadsheet. I mean, um, but I but I do have to show you this too. This is my college. Wow. HB 10B. This is like the old one. <laughs> the uh, I, I had this in uh, in my business school in college. Finance calculator, the Hewlett Packard 10B. Um, use it probably every day with an Excel spreadsheet. Um, yeah. That's couldn't, couldn't do without those. <laughs> that calculator takes me way back. <laughs> <laughs> that's an old one. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, can you tell us uh, a story about your biggest mistake in real estate investing so far? And what is the main takeaway for our listeners? Yeah, that's great. That's a great question. Yeah. So I, um, probably earlier on, you know, one of the things, so m one of my strengths is more underwriting. I'm an analyst. Um, you know, I'm a numbers person. So, one of the problems that personalities and, and people with my strengths have is we can look at a deal and we can underwrite a deal and see that the numbers make incredible sense. Um, and so early on when I was investing in multifamily residential, I saw a deal on Craigslist um, in San Antonio. Yeah. And I saw this deal and I looked at the numbers. I'm like, Oh my gosh, like, and I'm underwriting. I got my Excel spreadsheet. I got my HB 10 B. <laughs> You know, I got that thing going. I'm like, this is incredible. Like I'm going to recoup all of my investment in like the first year. I mean, it was like, this was a, a triplex that was being sold for like $130,000. And the rents were something like, you know, 1500, I think total rents were something like 1800 a month or something like that. So I thought I'm going to recoup all my money in like a year. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I went down there, I looked at it, you know, there was one tenant in there, um, and so I had an inspector looked at it and the foundation was the problem. Mm -hmm. And so the inspector told me, Hey, you know, um, this foundation, like it's settled it, it's fine. Like it's not going anywhere. The inspector told me that. So here's the thing. I'm like, Hey, I'm building a team. This is my inspector. He's telling me this. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I went ahead and closed the deal and, um, I, I think I was, I was on an international trip with with a nonprofit I work with I was in Ukraine and I was teaching over there and I get a phone call from my tenant and this is January 
Okay. Like it's, it's like negative 10 degrees in Ukraine and it's super cold in San Antonio too. But the sewage, like the, all the sewage underneath the place just broke and it was coming up through the bathtub and just, oh my God. And, and the tenants were like, we can't, we can't live here. What are we going to do? And so I had to literally move all those tenants out. I had to put them in a hotel for a week. And I was on the phone in Ukraine calling roto router which is not i mean this when you're calling roto router for a sewer thing in the winter i mean it's like i was anyway so it was a disaster it was a total mess biggest mistake you go in when you underwrite that thing like you got to fix the foundation on the front end um mm -hmm. but it was so stressful i cannot tell you my wife was on the phone i mean there were conversations with tenants where the tenants were angry and i was across the world racking up a major phone bill uh, but I learned a ton from that experience and I ended up getting through it and I, and I did make some money on that deal. Um, part of the other problem was that market I was in, that sub market was not a, a great place to be. It was just not a, you know, and so there wasn't enough thinking about the market. And so, so that really helped me to think through, okay, man, you know, you go into a property foundation, you can't mess around with the foundation, uh, double check that contractor, whatever he tells you. Um, and then also think more about the market. Like what is, what is going to lift this market up? Are there jobs coming in here? Are there, you know, is this neighborhood changing? Um, and so I, I, I take a lot of that into my syndications when, when our operators are talking about the market, I really think carefully about that kind of slow down and really consider that because that's something I wasn't thinking about a lot, um, in the past. And I think too, there, there are some deals that I've done really well on not thinking about the market. Mm -hmm. and not realizing, oh, it's the market that really helped in this situation, especially here in Austin. You know, I, I, I did well in Austin, not realizing it's, you know, the deal didn't underwrite well, but the market really made it do well. So, Would you buy another deal on Craigslist? <laughs> you know, I would. I would. <laughs> I, but, I, but I would be careful, again, about, um, yeah, just, the, just those couple of things. I yeah. think you can get a deal anywhere. You can get a deal... Mm -hmm. And a lot of different, you know, strange places. I mean, people, people make deals in parking lots, you know, yeah. people yeah. That they meet on the street. So yeah. super important to just make sure that you do your due diligence. Exactly. Right. Yep. All right. Uh, what is it that you need to do now to grow your life to the next level? Okay. So we're talking growing your life or growing business? Life. <laughs> life. Okay. So I, I, I realize you're asking that because you're, getting at something deeper. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So my stage of life, um, is different. You know, I am, um, mid forties guy. I've got a high school, you know, girl who's about to drive We've got kids. So I'm, I'm really thinking a lot more about, you know, balance and family time and even just personal health, you know? So I'll just say one, one thing that we've really kind of landed on was we are in a place where, my daughter is going to go to college in a couple of, you know, I don't know, what is it? She's a freshman now, three and a half years. She's gone. And so there's this family time that is very limited the next three years. It's very limited. And then these kids are, once they get their, once they get keys in their hand, then it begins. It doesn't begin in college. It begins before that when they get keys in their hands. Mm -hmm. So we're really thinking, okay, what kind of memories can we create with our family? What kind of experiences, um, can, can we do together? You know, I'm, I'm, I grew up in Montana in Western Montana. And so we're going to go up there this summer and I'm intentionally thinking about building memories and experiences, you know, hiking, camping, fishing. These are the kinds of things that we're really investing in our, our family now uh, so that, you know, we don't have a regret later to say, Hey, we didn't really do a lot of that because I was so busy working or doing real estate or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we're back at that balance is really key. Um, at the end of the day, why do we do real estate? Well, there's a bigger why and it's family. It's, it's the bigger vision of building something in our, in our lives. So that's a big part of it for us. Um, so. Yeah. I love that answer. <laughs> and uh, Mike, lastly, where can people find out more about you? Yeah. Well, um, go to our website. Uh, my email is Mike at steeplerockpartners.com. The website is steeplerockpartners.com. I'm on Bigger Pockets. I've got a, a blog on Bigger Pockets. I'm in the forums. Um, yeah, those are the two main places. 
Awesome. So thanks for your time and informing us about what your company does and the value that you can provide passive investors. Um, I think an important takeaway is making sure at the end of the day that there is an alignment of interest between the investor and their sponsor. So mm -hmm. definitely some great advice and tips that we can all take away from this interview. So thanks so much. You bet. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks, thanks Mike. Mike.